Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, I'm happy to chair this uh, next and actually last uh, session of, uh, of this wonderful conference. Um, and I'll take the opportunity to thank uh, Tamara and, uh, and Shelly uh, again for a really wonderful, uh, wonderful um, conference. Um, many, many issues and, and many thoughts and, and new frontiers of, of um, investigation. And it was it was great. So you guys are great collaborators. Um, you've done a few things together before, and uh, you've proven that it wasn't an accident. And you guys do that well. So thank you very much and, and for um, making this all thing possible. Um, and now to our next uh, uh, and last session of, uh, on crowd crowdsourcing enforcement. So the first paper is by Tamar Megiddo, uh, the organizer, uh, College of Law and Business. And uh, the, the paper is titled um, AstroTurfing Crowdsourcing Digital Domination Under the Cover of, of Emergency. And the commentator is Adam Shinao of the Reich, Reichman University. So we'll start with that. Um, Adam, you have 15 minutes and then Tamar 10, and then we open up for discussion and questions. So Adam. Okay, great. Thanks, Wunit. Uh, so thanks everybody and thanks Tamar and, and Shelly for, um, for inviting me to comment on the paper. I apologize for not being able to join in the previous two days, but I heard it was phenomenal. So congrats. Um, okay, so I think I'll actually probably speak less than 15 minutes uh, as, as to allow for more time for discussion. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but often I say this whenever I start to, to present that I'll speak less than my lot of time and I end up speaking more so I can't make any promises. Okay, so first, and I'll try to be brief because I, I assume many or most have uh, read the paper. Um, and I'll, I'll summarize uh, Tamar's main arguments. And then I'll offer um, some hopefully uh, hopefully constructive uh, uh, comments. So Tamar's paper uh, deals with the ways in which governments enlist non-governmental actors to monitor and surveil citizens. Uh, and this is already, I think, a welcome change from a lot of the literature that talks about the ways in which governments surveil citizens, and less so about the ways the way governments. Uh, uh, recruit other citizens to surveil other citizens. And there was talk about this, there was some literature about this as Tamar rightfully mentions in the, in the article. Uh, of course, uh, the East German example, the Stasi is, is a, but, but thinking about this in the technological sense, of course, presents new avenues uh, for exploration. So what, what Tamar does is that she examines this enlistment, this recruitment uh, by looking at government actions, uh, during the still ongoing COVID pandemic. And what she notes is that government relies on citizens to enforce the law. This is a truism and it's, it's obviously true, uh, but often, and often this doesn't raise any special problems. Ronit, I think your microphone is still on. And I think if you turn it off, I won't have this, maybe. Yeah, better for me at least. Okay, sorry. Um, so, um, Often, uh, citizens enforcing the law doesn't raise any problems. Uh, we need citizens to enforce uh, the law. Uh, but what the, th the thing is with technology, what technology does is that it makes governmental reliance on citizens much easier, even seamless. And the ease in which that can happen often is a great incentive to make it happen, right? It's, the technology is there, it's cheap, it's easy, then why don't we do it? Um, and how do we do it? Well, we have a lot of corporations and they collect significant vast amounts of data uh, and they can mobilize citizens. Um, and when there are emergencies, be they security related or economic emergencies or health pandemics like we have now, uh, they provide an additional layer of legitimization that makes enlistment even easier, right? Um, there is an article that I think tomorrow that you don't cite, but maybe you should, uh, by um, Mila Verstig and Adam Chilton that talks about the ways in which um, uh, citizens are more willing to give up on their rights during emergencies. Whether those emergencies are real or whether they're perceived, uh, the fact is that they perceive this is an emergency and they 
say, well, this is, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice some of our rights in order to achieve this greater good. And we all have to enlist, right, in, in, in this effort. So emergencies are, are, are great for, for, for doing that. Uh, and we're more willing to sacrifice of individual rights. Um, this uh, practice might allow governments to bypass legal restrictions. Uh, and while they bypass legal restrictions, simultaneously it augments their power uh, through private actors, but that, that also obscures who is doing the work here and who is responsible. Is it the government? Is it the private actor? Which private actor? Is it the corporation? Is it the individual citizen spying on a different citizen? Okay, and of course this fuzziness, once you have this fuzziness, that obviously undermines accountability because you don't know who is to blame for this and who are you supposed to go to, right? Who's in charge here? Um, and this is what Tamara calls, well, I think she's not the only one who calls it, but apparently this is a term that I wasn't familiar with called astroturfing. Um, uh, and that is creating the false impression that certain speech or certain action is driven a viral by widespread authentic behavior, where in fact it is inorganically driven in an organized manner by a party wishing to remain un unidentified. And this is the race to democracy. And I think it's very easy to, to figure out why this is, this is a problematic. You don't have to say anything more about this now. But and then, uh, um, um, the problem that Tamar notes is, of course, is the loss of accountability, but also the loss of oversight. When the government does something, and we know it's a government, we can say there are clear avenues through which we can act. And when it's not really clear what we're doing, then or who's doing it, then the oversight becomes more uh, murky. And Tamar's goal in this paper, which I think is laudable, and um, and it's a question whether she succeeds in the end, and, and, and you know, and I think you go a long way towards succeeding is um, where to draw the line, right? So where do we have legitimate reliance on private actors? And where does that legitimate reliance end? Because obviously in many, many cases, uh, some reliance will not be problematic, but in other cases will be. And of course, line drawing is always, is always necessary you know, it, on the one hand, it's always necessary. And on the second hand, it's always impossible, right? Because it's always gonna be over or under inclusive uh, uh, in, uh, 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 in some way. Okay, so what Tamar uh, finds especially problematic, especially pernicious is not necessarily state surveillance in of itself, but the use of citizens, right? Uh, citizen surveillance in the service of uh, uh, in the service of the state. And when the state enlists citizens to spy on one another, okay, uh, which technology makes very easy, um, um, signing up for a service and giving the software access to all your data or to your contacts or to some of your data, okay? And the problem with this kind of enlistment is, and here Tamar draws on the work of Philip Pettit, is the problem of domination which she already talked about in previous work that she wrote called Digital Domination. And here, I understand her to be developing this concept uh, 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 further in a democracy that uh, Pettit tells us, um, uh, the democracy that values freedom, no citizen or the state should have ultimate power over another citizen. Therefore, holding the power to set the government on another with ease alone qualifies as domination within Pettit's conceptualization. This is a, a quote directly from Tamar's uh, paper. And that in itself is problematic because it violates a core tenet of uh, 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 democracy. Moreover, in order for have a functioning democracy, um, we need a contestatory citizenry that regulates the ex exercise of public power. And the idea of contestatory citizenry is also an idea drawn from uh, from Pettit's work. Um, so mass surveillance in the way that Tamara describes in the paper renders all of these values questionable because they limit resistance to government. If people can, if you know people spy on you, uh, you're not likely to trust them. This erodes civic trust. It, it makes organization, collective action and mobilization much more difficult. Because in order to mobilize, you have to trust the people who you're mobilizing with. And if you think people are infiltrating your group, if they're spying on you, if their information goes to somebody else, you're not very likely to go and mobilize, right? Because you'll be concerned all the time that whatever you're doing 
it will be thwarted by the government and you end up in jail or an interrogation room or, um, or, or, or similar, okay? Um, so, so what, so what, so then where is the line drawn? So Tamar doesn't really tell us exactly where to draw the line, but she offers us uh, um, five important benchmarks that we need to ask ourselves in order to consider and answering them, then we'll get the answer whether this action is on the right side, that it's okay, that it's not problematic, or is it on the wrong side and we should be more concerned. And I won't go into them fully, I'll just mention those benchmarks. The first one is whether the government actor uh, has authority to mobilize the citizens. Uh, is the government uh, authority for which citizens are deployed a core function that cannot be privatized? And uh, does a citizen merely assist the government, which then would be maybe okay, uh, 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 but, or, or is a citizen replacing, replacing the, um, uh, 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 the government and whether the mobilization is covert or whether it's transparent, that's number one. Number two is um, what happens to individuals, right? Are their core human rights violated? Uh, do they have a right over a hearing to contest their claims? Uh, if they do, do they have a right to appeal to a higher authority after they've been found to commit something? Um, third benchmark is a question of size. How many citizens are deployed and how many are subject to enforcement? Numbers matter. It's, there's, it's one thing if there's a, an enlistment of citizens to surveil 10 citizens, as opposed to an enlistment of citizens to survey a million citizens, right? And this is obviously clear. Um, uh, and Fourth is the mobilization of citizens done for a public good, right? Are, are, is there, is, are we mobilizing citizens for some sort of good public purpose, whatever, however that is defined? Uh, or we're merely, the government is merely doing this to entrench its hold on power to make sure that it doesn't change, that the incumbent uh, stays in power, etc. And then the last, uh, the last uh, criterion uh, is whether there is a, whether there's an emergency. Uh, and if so, we should be especially vigilant, Tamar tells us, because citizens act less critically in times of emergency, as I've already mentioned before when I discussed the, the Mila versus the Adam Chilton case. Okay, so that's the paper. And I think it's, it's, I think it's a great paper. It's wonderful. It's very, very rich. And I think it, it's, it's, it's really uh, a step in the right direction in thinking about this problem that Tamar identified, which again, existed in the past with communist regimes and so forth, but now we have to think about this in a new, new context. And I think that's very innovative and very cool. And I think holds a lot of promise. Um, and so here are a few, uh, a few comments, um, uh, hopefully friendly, friendly comments, or they'll be construed as friendly comments. Um, so first of all, the paper, like I said, is concerned with recruitment of citizens in emergencies against fellow citizens. But if we're really um, humanistic or cosmopolitan, uh, or if we really care about rights, why do we need to limit the, our scope to against fellow citizens, right? So suppose, for example, the emergency is some type of a war or even an unjust war, right? Does astroturfing become more legitimate when the target is citizens who live elsewhere um, or uh, you know, citizens of another country, even if there's no war? Or what about people who are not citizens? who live in the country. You know, they could be tourists, they could be permanent residents, they could be refugees or asylum seekers. You know, there's a lot of people who are not citizens, both inside or outside the country, that we can think about uh, and uh, about uh, surveilling them, which happens, and whether does that become more or less legitimate because of their um, status, whether they're citizens or not. Now, it could be that, they, that it doesn't, and it's just using the word citizen is just a trope, but but uh, but if it's not, then I'm curious to hear why. A second point. Adam, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt. Two minutes. Okay, so you see, I I, I already yeah. I, oversold, I oversold my. You case. promised. You promised. Okay, you so promised. so I'll be very very quick. Damn, this is actually my critical help. Okay, so here's the second comment. What is the meaning of ultimate power over another versus simply power? Right? So Pettit's work is about ultimate, or your work is about ultimate power and not just power. Obviously, we exercise power all the time over citizens over another and the governments over citizens, but only when that power becomes ultimate is Pettit's concern for domination triggered. Um, not all types of surveillance are ultimate. There's some, sometimes just power and not ultimate power. And how do we 
uh, and how do we uh, uh, distinguish? So um, Pettit's uh, definition is holding the power to set the government on another with ease alone qualifies as domination within its conceptualization, as you write. But it doesn't seem right. It seems too broad, right? So there are a lot of systems in place uh, where citizens report on other citizens. Uh, we report on traffic violations, we report on uh, uh, income tax violations, fraud. Um, we obviously report to the police when we see something is afoot, right? Could be our neighbors, it could be, we could be involved, maybe we're just third parties. Um, obviously, we have a lot of power to set the government on other people, and we don't think this raises a problem. Pettit thinks that it does. I don't think that it does uh, as much as Pettit does. Um, okay. So I think the problem is not domination, actually. I think with a, a, a related problem that comes, comes across in your paper is the collective and preventative character of what's going on, right? So the problem is that it's not individually tailored. The problem is that it treats citizens as if they are the enemy. And therefore, it sort of sells them. Uh, and they're, it's making a claim that they're operating outside the social contract. Um, and the problem in all the measures you described, the problem is that these measures are deployed in this kind of blanket sweeping and preventative way that a priori views citizens in, in such a way. But that's, and, and the, so the problem here is not necessarily domination, I think, and, which is always hard to define, but the way in which we perceive the subject or the object of our, our surveillance. Um, and then my last point is about the criteria which you, uh, uh, which you, uh, uh, which you suggest. Um, so as for the first criteria, I don't know why it's important to ask whether the government has authority. I mean, it's important in the most, in, in, in a very regular, normal sense is that every government action needs to have authority, right? This has nothing to do with surveillance or domination. It's just a truism. So I think, I, I don't know why that is a special uh, uh, case. As for the third requirement, um, yes, mass surveillance uh, potentially affects everybody, but not every aspect of surveillance is problematic. And sometimes what matters is the aggregated effect. Each activity on its own will not violate core human rights, but together they do. What do we do then? When we, do we look at the aggregate? Do we look at the individual aspect? Um, the, uh, the fourth criteria, um, criterion, the, about, the point about entrenching, every government seeks to entrench its power. I mean, this is just true. I mean. Uh, in many, many ways, you know, for example, we give money funds, we allocate government funds to people who we think that if we give those money will then support us come next election or we, or we design policies in order to uh, elicit more votes. So it's very difficult to distinguish between the, the, the good entrenchment and uh, 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 bad entrenchment. And I don't think, and, and you, I think we should think about it, at least that point. And then my last point, yeah, um, uh, no time for last point. It's super, uh, super, super, super swift. Okay. You're very convincing. So, yeah. I, I would have been Adam, over by, by now. Okay. No, no, no problem at all. You're right. People uh, react uh, less critically in emergencies. So, we need to be vigilant. But it's also true that there are real emergencies sometimes. Okay. And in genuine emergencies, what do we do? Because those are your energies that might require swift action. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Well done. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, yeah, Tamar, you're on. Hey, first of all, thank you so much. This is very helpful and a lot uh, to think about. Let me try to give some some uh, uh, comeback, but most of it I'll just have to go back to the drawing board. So. Um, let me say that when I say citizens, and I think that's the case for Pettit generally, I don't mean people holding the national ID, I mean people part of the political community, and to me that includes refugees and non-citizens living uh, in the country. So, so that's, it's not the technical term. Uh, but the question remains, and I think it's a good question, what happens, wh why do I restrict the discussion to citizens of one country and not uh, also condemn uh, the spying on other citizens, and I don't have a good, uh, a very good answer to that. I think there is, um, there is a, a power to thinking about democracy within a particular state, and um, that doesn't mean that you can think about democracy and sort of um, uh, obligations or responsibility of of citizens of one country towards the citizens of another. I think you should and you can. Um, but, uh, 
but maybe that's sort of the next step. I'm trying to contain the discussion in order to think about the principles. And maybe, maybe when I do succeed finally in identifying what they are, then, then uh, I should probably test them to see if that also works uh, to citizens of other countries. And if it doesn't, then maybe that is, maybe that is an, a problem that I, I need to go back and, and think about. Um, what is the meaning of ultimate power versus just power? So that's a good question. I think for Petit, everyone deploys power over another, but ultimate power is a power that is unchecked. Right, so in a de democratic uh, uh, situation, everyone has power, the government has power, other citizens have power, but the government helps us in checking the power of others and we help each other in checking the, the power of government, et cetera. And so that is ultimate power. And, and I, so I agree that not all surveillance is ultimate. My worry is exactly, and maybe that's another uh, border drawing exercise that I need to do here, is in identifying when that surveillance becomes ultimate power, right? So if it's reporting on uh, traffic violations the, and the sanction is, an, is a, a fine, then I agree with you that that's, that's not such a big deal, right? So when does the violation and the foreseeable sanction for reporting it become such that it sort of uh, crosses the threshold into ultimate power? Um, I, I, and that's, I think that's a, that's a question. Um, you say the problem is not domination, but sort of the perception or the, the designation of certain citizens as the enemy or citizens generally as the enemy and the blanket uh, deployment of surveillance. Um, so I, I agree, but I think there is something to this move uh, where Often there is, it's not that all citizens, it's not necessarily that all citizens are deployed as enemies. And sometimes we have an issue of, I, I write this briefly in the paper of uh, sort of creating uh, camps, the us and them, the uh, party supporters and the non-party supporters, and then deploying the uh, surveillance apparatus uh, uh, against those who are these internal enemies. But I think if we think about the COVID situation, that in a sense, we did see governments or our government think of everyone as a potential enemy, right? As a, as a carrier and a spreader of the disease that, is, that, that warrants their surveillance. And so that, that but can I, I mean, can everyone in a society be considered an enemy? Can every citizen be a potential enemy? That's, it, it's, it almost it doesn't make sense. Um, so I'll have to think more about this. I think there's there's an interaction here between the deployment of, sur of surveillance and the designation of someone as an enemy or a group as an enemy. That I'll have to I'll have to think more about this interaction. Um, and I'll just I I think I agree with most of your comments about the criteria. And this is obviously the least developed part and the one I'm still thinking about. And I'll I'll, I'll try to go back and think about. Um, about most of the, these things. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Tara. Um, and we'll open the floor to questions from uh, everyone. So, uh, Jose, you're first. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Tamar. I think I, I really love your paper, and I think it's a great uh, project. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to read the final version of it. Um, let me just make a couple of, well, first of all, I, I like uh, that you use uh, Philip Pettit's uh, notion of domination, and I think that it, it might be really useful, actually, in this, in this context. So let me just suggest a couple of, of uh, things that might help you actually to, to uh, develop the paper. One is maybe you might want to take a look on, on the discussion that has been going on basically in criminal law theory. And now I remember uh, specifically a paper by Anthony Duff uh, regarding the civic duties that citizens have uh, in any political community including also the duties maybe to denounce what other uh, citizens have done and and more generally to collaborate with the criminal justice system. So I think that there, there, you might find some clues there about an interesting discussion that in a way parallels what, you, what, what you're doing. 
that's one thing. And then re regarding the criteria, uh, which I find excellent uh, in many respects. Um, so one thing that uh, I, I can, you know, I, I'm actually writing also a paper on crowdsourcing in times of emergency. So I, I, I will be in touch with you and uh, I will ask you for permission for citing this project as a work in progress or something like that. But, uh, um, but you know, one of the difficulties that I find, and I think that we share the problem, is how we can define emergency, right? And um, it's it's true, as Adam was saying, uh, there are emergencies, so we all know that. Uh, so there are exceptional times, and if we take that idea seriously, that means that. We should be flexible when we design our legal systems because we should make it possible for introduce some exceptions in some uh, cases. The problem with that is that um, how you that how you define the emergency situation, right? So of course the pandemic has been an emergency for a while. I don't know if it or still is or not when it stops being it and so on, but. Uh, if you think on climate emergency, it's also an emergency, but it seems to be much more permanent. And, and I don't know if, if we call it an emergency and then we open up all those exceptional uh, mechanisms that we design only for exceptional times, then we might find ourselves living permanently in exceptional, in crisis or in emergencies. Or So there's a problem of a slippery slope here, of course. And, and then lawyers normally prefer to define these exception uh, laws uh, very strictly, and and so I would like to hear more about what, how are you thinking about this, and and finally, my very last uh, question. It's it's of course a question. So in in the first criterion, you ask yourself whether citizens are deployed um, uh, to replace uh, the government, so to speak, in a in a core government power. But I, I don't really see why this should be relevant. Uh, it, of course, it all depends on what you mean by replacing. Uh, but I guess that when, when, if in general we are in favor of participatory uh, mechanisms, citizen engagement, and crowdsourcing, at least in some conditions, right? So if we are open to these kind of innovations, uh, so in a way, any form of citizen engagement replaces something that uh, otherwise, if you don't have this citizen engagement, someone in the government will do. Uh, or will not do, maybe it will refrain from doing, but in a way you are replacing that by action or omission, right? And, and so I, I don't really, and I don't fully understand the, the relevance of uh, uh, this notion of replacing here. I think it's more, I think it's if, if um, uh, using uh, these citizens and these techniques uh, is an, of assistance, as you say, in, a farther, in another criteria, if it can help to promote the public good and it can help the government to uh, perform uh, its responsibilities, uh, then it should be welcome and otherwise probably not. We should be cautious about these other use, uses. But, but the word replacement makes a little bit, uh, so it's not, not clear to me. Thanks, but wonderful paper. Yeah. Come on. Okay, thanks so much. These are very helpful. I'd love to see uh, the paper you're writing when you're comfortable sharing it. Um, thanks for the criminal law reference. I'll look into it. Actually, when I, I was looking for literature about denouncements and inform informants, and there's actually very little out there in legal literature otherwise, other than in criminal law, and I didn't pick up that thread because it seemed too far away, but maybe I should rethink that. Um, about how to define emergencies, um, yeah, <laughs> that's that's a huge uh, that's a huge question that I need to think about how to bracket actually I think in this project because I, there's a limit to what I can do, and as just sort of to give you the sense of what I have in mind when I think about this problem is the fact that Israel has been in a state of a declared state of emergency since its uh, existence. So we have always been in emergency, and every slippery slope you can think of, we've, we're we're there. So that really troubles me. Um, and, and then still when we have the pandemic, which is an actual emergency, right? And we still succeed in slipping further down and opening up additional exceptions. Uh, so um, I, don't, I don't have a good answer to that, but I, I, I need to at least recognize that that's a big elephant in, in, the, uh, in the paper, I agree. About the replacer assist criterion. So what I had in mind here, and maybe I should uh, think about how to uh, uh, 
define this uh, better. I have in mind the role of sort of neighborhood watches or people who assist the police, for instance. And then they, maybe they even have uniforms, maybe they ride on in police, police cars, but it's clear that they're not replacing the institution. They're helping the institution. And that's maybe something that we'd like to sort of have more, uh, you know, more people assist the police and more people on the ground and bringing the police closer to the community, et cetera. And if that's generally maybe a good thing, but there's still this institution with all the checks and balances that go with that, that, that is still in place. And if someone missteps or you know, uh, uh, exceeds their authority, then you have someone to, somewhere to go to and complain. But if a person replaces the cop and I don't know, uh, arrests someone or tortures someone or whatever, then that, that's, uh, that's a different kind, I think, of relationship that I was worried about. Um, but you're, you're right to say that this is, it's much more vague or, or gray than that in reality. And so I'll, I'll try to think about how to define this better. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alon. I, um, well, it, it's, it's, it's a great project. Uh, you know what I think about it in general. And, and, I, and I like the direction of the paper. Um, the discussion made me think about there's you mainly discuss the way that um, astroturfing become a legitimate through the notion of emergency, right? Like through um, a hard stop changes the normative, and then there's stickiness that might um, that might make it uh, more legitimate later. But there's another way that, and actually it, it relates to the Stasi kind of way of, of operating in human intelligence in general, of, um, of slowly eroding boundaries and what is normal and what is normal, not normal. So if you recruit an informant, you might at first just use it, ask, ask them to um, take a photograph of, um, of a shopping mall. And then later on, ask them more. And the same can be said about recruiting, first recruiting citizens to report traffic violations and, um, and about tax evasion and tax fraud. And then later on, it might be more plausible to ask more of them to be more of a surveillance or peer-to-peer -peer surveillance. And, and it relates, it, it directly relates, of course, to a nuts uh, yesterday's paper regarding elector that uses all those kind of mechanisms in, in a way of pushing the boundaries slowly. And, and so there's another, so I think perhaps perhaps acknowledging all those that also that direction is, is could be important also in this, this distincting when legitimacy, can, where can we put the line that helps us distinguish of uh, a hard, harder line that helps us distinguish between legitimacy and illegitimate because there's it's a, a line that's it's harder to erode in, in a way. Um, can you can you explain that last sentence again? What the role of yeah, teachers so in the providing criteria that will be harder to erode through. So, for instance, um, I'll use Sharon's uh, uh, article, but um, reporting on corporations, reporting on citizens, could be a harder line to stop than what is the severity of of uh, uh, of the of the act that is surveilled because so it's it's not on a scale it could be made more it might be more resilient to attempts to erode it um and, and an additional thing is and it regards the replacing and uh, again i refer to sharon's article is the distinguishment between monitoring and enforcement so you use in the paper you focus on monitoring but it's more it's it relates to enforcement and i think when we talk about replacing it means also crowdsourcing enforcement by itself. So it might be um, helpful to think about it through that um, notion as well. Okay, thanks so much. That's actually very helpful. The last point, um, I, 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 I mean, it speaks to me. I think there's something there about the, because I'm also worried, the paper is more explicitly about um, uh, monitoring um, generally, but I am I'm 
worried about the distinction between enforcing law and enforcing policy, right? And this goes back to not, maybe to a not, or sort of when the, when the distinguishing the situation between the citizen being um, the messenger or the, the eyes and ears of a party versus the state. So that's, that's a line I'm interested in, I think. So that's helpful. I'll, I'll think about this more. And I agree with everything you said about this uh, uh, slowly uh, eroding. And, and, and uh, I, was, I was grinning because uh, um, we had, there was a story that came out in the press yesterday about uh, uh, Israeli women who were recruited to spy for Iran. And Alon was uh, making this, this uh, comment on Twitter this morning. And I didn't realize it was, it was pertinent here too. Um, and thanks about the uh, sort of harder criteria. I'll have to think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Alon and Shelina. Hi. Um, so thanks, Tamar. This is really interesting and rich. And I just, so this is a really small comment. Um, and I want to try to connect the sort of the distinction that you make in the argument to the distinction that we made many times here in the conference in the last uh, couple of days. And I think it has something to do with the distinction between crowds and communities, right? So perhaps um, we sort of want to distinguish between situations where the state treats um, its citizens yeah, uh, as a crowd, that means um, dispersed, not connected, perhaps means to an end. And when it when it relies on its citizens for their civic participations in sort of um, uh, participating in creating norms or, or group solidarity. Um, so um, it doesn't solve the problem, but you just thought that this is a, a, perhaps another framework to think about it. That's actually really interesting because I think maybe the point about astroturfing is that the, the this government is playing a double game here in some way. I'm not exactly sure how to superimpose this on, on our discussion of crowds and communities, but basically uh, it enlists citizens based on their maybe, uh, at least, at least uh, in, in the message based on their commitment to the community and the, you know, the improvement of the public good, et cetera. But really what it does, I think, is turn them into a crowd, right? It, 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 it erodes their ability to, to remain a community by, by deploying one against another. Um, so yeah, that's, that's actually great, thanks. Thank you, and Anna. Yes, thanks and thanks Tamar for this really, I mean, a uh, new concept for me that you're helping us familiarize with, at least myself. Um, my question, um, let's say, I would like just to throw a scenario to you just to ask what you think about if you would consider this astroturfing and which implication it could have. So, you know, two days ago we spoke about civic monitoring. Imagine that a civic monitoring initiative is being, let's say, embraced by a governmental actor and basically some citizen, let's say sentinels are invited to, to just cooperate with the government in um, feeding information. Then my question is, well, first there could be a risk of governmental capture. So basically this initiative is not any longer making only the common interest, grassroots interest, but rather some hidden governmental agenda that managed to shape the initiative. And also would you consider this astroturfing because the initiative started as grassroots, but then became kind of appropriated by a governmental actor, which can be seen as support at the start, but then could end up being indeed a capture. So it's, it's just a scenario that you made me think of and, and I wanted to ask you what you think about. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. So I, I should say that this is not my term. This is something I picked up. It's not used much in uh, scholarship, but I have seen it in uh, reporting more from sort of civil society when writing about um, uh, digital militias, which was something I wrote about in a previous paper. Uh, where we see all kinds of governments really all over the world recruiting these uh, uh, troll armies to monitor and report and harass uh, their, uh, their opponents or journalists or, uh, or uh, um, political activists, et cetera. 
and they are able to hide behind these uh, these armies and not own up to the to to their speech or their action or even if that results in actual violence in real life and that happens. Um, so this is the kind of of movement that astroturfing uh, tries to uh, to convey that there is a fake grassroots movement that is actually propelled by the government. Uh, and that and that's why it's it's uh, sort of it's pernicious, it's double pernicious, right? Because they are creating harm and hiding behind uh, these mobilized groups. And so I think if what you're describing can qualify as astroturfing, if the government not only sort of uh, takes control over this grassroots movement, but also hides behind it. And I think so. What uh, what is unique to, to astroturfing is this uh, non-transparency aspect of it. So if the government transparently sort of provides support or financial support or just recognition of the actions of, of citizens, then maybe that's less the case. But if it, it, if it stays in the background and doesn't reveal its, its uh, involvement, then, then I would, I would uh, think about this as astroturfing. Um, and, as, and, I, and that's also where this project is coming from. And I'll just take a minute to say that because I saw how really everywhere in, in the world, the, the amount of reporting on, on uh, cases of astroturfing uh, is, is crazy. And we have no idea, right? We think our populist prime minister is uh, incredibly popular on Twitter or Facebook, and maybe he is, but he's also bought himself tens of thousands of supporters who raise his visibility and, and you know, get likes and, and comment, et cetera. And that's, it's not unique to any particular country. It's really very, very uh, spread. And so I started thinking about the various sort of roles that, that this clandestine action by governments uh, is changing our lives. And, and so this is what, how this project was born. So let me th say thank you to Adam and to all the commentators. These are really great comments and I'll, I'll go back to the drawing board. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Tamar and Adam and everyone who asked questions. Um, we're, I think we'll move on to our next panel. Um, okay, so we have a paper by Sharon Yadin of the University of Haifa uh, called Crowdsourcing Regulatory Monitoring and Enforcement. And our commentator who will present uh, the paper and then make some comments on that is uh, Alon Hasper of Tel Aviv University. So uh, Alon, you have uh, 15 minutes and, um, and then uh, Sharon will, will respond. Sorry, I was thrown by the, the PowerPoint. I thought it might have been mine somehow, so yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Ronit. Thank you, Tamar and Shelley, for uh, for such a such a great uh, event. What what I really liked about uh, these three days is that uh, in each panel, each panel made me think about other uh, articles that were not presented in that panel. Uh, so that, that's that's really nice how it all comes uh, comes together. Um, so the title for my comment is "Seeing Like a Crowd, Acting Like a Mob." And it's a, it's a comment to crowdsourcing regulatory monitoring and enforcement by uh, Sharon Yadin. Um, I'll, I'll first present the, the, the main argument of the, of the paper and then try to, to provide some insights um, that might be helpful to Sharon, but also I think uh, could be uh, instrumental in thinking about this uh, uh, subject in, in more general. So, the, the article is about crowdsourcing regulatory monitoring and enforcement. So uh, Sharon defines for the sake of the, of the article, crowdsourcing as online distributed problem solving and production model that leverage the collective intelligence of online communities to serve specific organization goals. And regulation she defines in a quite narrow way, which I think is, 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 is spot on for, the, for this article, is any activity performed by an administrative authority in the executive branch of government that aims to control or influence the behavior of corporations and other private non-governmental organizations that operate in market and industry uh, sectors. So crowdsourcing regulatory monitoring is using, uh, it's an agency that uses online distributed problem solving to monitor 
behavior and enforcement is the same about enforcement. So regarding the crowdsourced monitoring, um, uh, Sharon um, describes to us how agencies invite the public to report regulated firms, such as for the banking mistreatment of cons consumers, product defects and others. And she provided a great example of the um, CFBP that has a site where you can provide complaints about um, um, uh, banking mistreatment of co consumers and other uh, uh, and other sectors, and you can see from this uh, from this graph that uh, it's about it, it has the number of, of complaints in int reported in each quadrant since January 2012, and the average number throughout the U.S. is around 120,000 um, reports per quarter in the in the past year or so. Uh, so it's a sub substantial amount, and crowdsource enforcement. Um, Process enforcement, Sharon tells us, is when agencies publish adverse publications on firms' regulatory violations in order to publicly shame them into compliance, using this public as a vehicle to pressure firms. So here's an example, again, that um, Sharon will later on uh, develop into a full uh, case study of OSHA that um, used Twitter, for example, to notify the, pu the, uh, the public about violations uh, regarding um, um, work safety. Um, so, so now they have the notions in mind. Um, Sharon further makes an, an important uh, distinction between outsourcing and crowdsourcing. So while outsourcing, traditional outsourcing, is used to companies who are few entities and through formal delegation that use mainly through contracts, um, crowdsourcing involves uh, uh, using individ individuals who are many entities and in an informal ways. So there's no specific legal obligation and undertaking between the two, between the government and uh, those uh, private entities, which is important. Now, the central part of the, of the article, article so far, and uh, that is really, really good is, is uh, the discussion of benefits and costs. So regarding benefits, you can see that most of the benefits are, are shared both by uh, crowdsource uh, enforcement and crowdsource monitoring, include supplementing shortage in public resources, the low cost of operation, avoiding uh, regulatory capture, an answer to declining uh, trust in regulation. It, it infuses democratic values to regulation. It goes beyond legal compliance. Um, uh, um, shout out to Tamara in, in, the, uh, in the earlier discussion. It diminishes regulatory friction. And enforcement also has relatively effectiveness. So there are some empirical studies that show that in some specific context. And regarding monitoring, it improves information by producing information that otherwise would not be available in the same way, or it would be really costly to produce. Now, the discussion of cost is, is, a, is, is, uh, is a little bit less developed currently in the paper. And my comment later will try to push Jerome into that, uh, to develop that part also. Uh, but currently, um, Sharon discussed how enforcement might be unreliable, unreliable and biased. The same goes to monitoring. There's a lack of control of shaming and reporting parties. And regarding enforcement, it might, shaming might produce disproportional responses and there's a lack of recourses, of, of legal recourse. So there's a problem with due process about what to do when, when the shaming is done wrongfully or disproportionately. So there's no way to legally provide a remedy. Now, in the, my comment, I want to first historicize crowdsource regulation, um, which is just the way I think about most things, and then think about the modes of governments that uh, the, the question of this mode of government and what are the institutional implications if it becomes more widespread. And I think that the one of the things that makes Sharon's article so important is because we have good reasons to think, and this entire conference uh, made it uh, made me more sure of, of, of that prediction that crowdsource uh, regulatory monitoring and enforcement will become more widespread in the future. So uh, it's, it becomes a, 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 a central instrument of the way a lot of regulatory bodies think about what to do next. Um, so I think that there's, there are good reasons to think of what will become, what will, will, 
what are, will be the dynamics, the institutional dynamics of it becoming more widespread. So just a, a bit, a quick view from history. Some of it is derived directly from the article and from another article by Sharon about regulatory shaming. Some of it, I just added lumps together. Uh, so there's the, first there's, there's a nice regarding uh, monitoring Boca de Leon, uh, the, there's um, a mouth of the lions are um, engraving in the Republic of Venice, still uh, possible to view them today, uh, where you could put a letter sometimes anonymous and to complain about um, the conduct uh, both of officials and non-official um, 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 citizens. Uh, another more that was raised also earlier by Adam is tax evasion complaints, obviously widespread across the world. Um, Sharon mentioned also class action uh, as a way of, of using uh, the public to, to monitor or, and of the government in a way solicitating the um, monitoring of regulatory infringement by creating that incentives, this private incentive to, to bring uh, class actions. So uh, it's, it's, I think the thinking about crowdsourcing also makes us reconsider prior um, 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 practices, which is, which is nice. And lastly, there's the law of the mob. So we have here uh, a picture of, of, of Dion Diamond, who was arrested during a sit-in in the Cherrydale Drug Fair in Arlington, Virginia, when he tried to protest against uh, segregation laws. And what we can see here, there's, there's a lot of people here who arrest him. And there are private citizens who um, many times sanctioned by the government and even encouraged by the government uh, monitored not only Dan Diamond and other activists' um, conduct, but also how the establishment's uh, conduct and did establishment and enforce segregation, even when some uh, establishment owners did not have a strong inclination to segregate. So there's um, there are some really problematic um, um, antecedents of uh, regulatory, crowdsourced regulatory monitoring. And regarding enforcement, so, you know, that we have the Mark of Cain, the Scarlet Letter, famous great examples, uh, the pillories and other public punishment uh, that use shaming also, public shaming as a tool to, uh, to sanction um, and, and behavior. Uh, we also have um, um, specific um, 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 examples from religion, specifically Judaism, that in Israel uh, makes its statist uh, affair. So we have regulation by um, by courts who publicly ostracize uh, people, for example, men who refuse to give a get, uh, and other examples. Uh, but also, there's an, here's an interesting uh, correlation: the use of shaming is prevalent in the food industry in general. Uh, and it goes beyond uh, just um, new, uh, new ways of, 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 uh, of, uh, of regulation. And we have an example also in both Judaism and uh, regulation by, uh, by states with this example of um, a note to the public published by the chief rabbinate of Giva Time, uh, which is a city in Israel, uh, that let let people know with through a poster uh, that they remove the supervision of kosher from uh, a falafel establishment. Uh, what's interesting about this case? There's there were a backlash, so the falafel establishment published its own poster explaining that they refused to pay unnecessary sums to the chief rabbinates. So there are all kinds of interesting dynamics that, ho that happen and also regarding uh, the mob law that I mentioned earlier, uh, that could be um, um, interesting to think about through, about what would happen uh, to uh, crowdsourced monitoring and enforcement. And another example, of course, the NYC Health Food Establishment Inspector Inspections website. So there's, you can see on, on the right uh, part of, or part of the screen, uh, the grade A, grade B, and grade C. Grade A is the best, grade C is the worst. So there's obviously shaming of being, of having a B or C 
a certificate from the um, from uh, the from the um, from the city, and it's published both online and physically in the establishment. So there's there's an interesting correlation here between the techno the new technology and uh, old special spatial uh, organization. Now moving from history to now, what kind of mode of governance is crowdsourced regulation? So there's an old distinction uh, that might be um, might be helpful between litigation and regulation so litigation is made by private actors by many private actors it made it it is made ex post after a violation and it enforced in many times standards uh, on the upper side we have regulation where it's done by public agency few actors it's done prior to um, to the violations in many times and it enforce rules. So what's crowdsourced regulation? It's a synthesis of previous modes. It's it's a question. So um, I, I'm not sure what's my answer about it, but I really want to hear what your own thinks about it. And do we get the best of both worlds, or do we get the worst of both worlds? So from from the last the last two minutes, um, it turns out, I'll, I'll talk about um, first about monitoring and then about enforcement. So regarding monitoring, there's, I think many literatures have a shared way of describing the, um, the 19th century and 20th century um, history of states as developing administrative agencies that produced a way of seeing like a state. Uh, that's taken directly from uh, Scott. Um, and, and what happens when the state stops seeing like a state, but decide to see like a crowd of producing, um, of producing a lot of its knowledge about society through the crowd? So a few possible uh, institutional implications is first the crowding out of the state. So um, Sharon um, uh, um, argues that uh, crowding, um, cr um, crowdsourcing, monitoring help might help against diminished resources of, of the state, but it might also be the problem as it will replace adding um, adding more resources to the state, and it might also legitimate further reducing resources. So when we know that kind of, of dynamic from other instances of privatization, so it might try to crowd out the state, and it might also crowd in corporations. So here's a problematic uh, um, example of Amazon's ring, where it seems like individuals are um, crowded in and are used to monitor um, um, conduct, but actually it also brings in huge corporations and not only the individuals. So there's, there's a problem here of crowding in corporations as well. It also opens up the avenue for industrial manipulation. Uh, so the kind of, of traditional astro, astroturfing uh, done in, uh, in, um, in, the, in the commercial, um, um, sector, and there's also a question of how do crowdsourcing monitoring treats the crowds? Are they um, treated as objects, which means we only use them as sensors to gather information, or do we treat them as subjects? And there's, I think there's, a te there's an inner tension in how the, um, how developing the mechanism that, in, that produce crowdsourcing would um, would be more about object or subject and we produce different benefits and costs in, in each. No, Lastly, the, the time is up. I'm, I'm yeah, really so, sorry. Uh, so so gonna, please just tie everything up, okay? Yeah, okay. So really, really lastly, there's the problem of acting like a mob. It relates directly to Tomas' uh, article of how, what happens to the rule of law. There's a problem of arbitrary, arbitrariness with lack of enforcement policy, lack of legal discourse, but also of equality of who can enforce 
and the digital divide, group organization and reproducing existing qualities might be a problem. And I really hope that Sharon will further develop her article to discuss all those, also those kind of problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alon. Uh, we'll move on to Sharon, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ronit. Uh, I would like to begin with uh, uh, thanking uh, Shelley and Tamar for their gracious uh, invitation to speak today in this uh, wonderful workshop and congratulate them on uh, uh, great success. Um, uh, and of course, I want to thank Alon for taking the time to read and uh, prepare this uh, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, also thank all uh, the other readers who might have had the chance to sk skim through or uh, read uh, the what is really a draft, uh, rough draft. Um, I, I want to start with a, a few uh, general comments and then to move uh, and answer some of uh, Alon's uh, great uh, uh, comments. Uh, of course, I, I, I won't have the time to uh, address all of them, but uh, we will definitely continue, uh, Alon, if that's okay with you, uh, to talk after uh, the workshop. Um, so I'll start with saying that uh, the paper focuses on governmental rather than private crowdsourcing. If I have to look at all the presentations that we've heard uh, in the last couple of days, and uh, specifically, I'm interested in the regulatory functions of the state. So uh, in the regulatory landscape, we are used to think about uh, processes like notice and comment as a tool that relies on the public for their uh, input, uh, for information, to hear the, from their to learn from their experience and gather opinions uh, in regards to uh, the rulemaking process. Um, so, uh, 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 differently from that, or uh, as something to add to to that layer, this project aims. Um, to shed light on some less familiar forms of uh, public participation in the regulatory process, uh, which is the monitoring, monitoring of firms and the enforcement of regulatory norms uh, on firms. Uh, and I, I was happy to discover that uh, a lot of uh, other scholars who participated in this symposium also took uh, an interest in this uh, avenue. And I think that um, this, is a, this could be a, a great addition to the uh, regulatory uh, scholarship, um, scholars who talk about uh, crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing uh, regulatory enforcement and compliance and monitoring uh, uh, with various uh, discussions and uh, you know, each scholar is focused on another direction, and uh, it's really it's really something. Uh, so um, uh, I focus that on crowdsourcing that is uh, actively guided and facilitated by administrative regulators, and uh, that this is an, an important uh, distinction that uh, should be. Um, should be put on, on the table. Um, so the theoretical, and, and something on the theoretical argument that is at the heart of uh, my paper, uh, uh, and that is uh, that I'm going to say that regulation today is crowdsourced, uh, at least in part, uh, through all stages of regulatory process, and not only pertaining to the rulemaking stage, and that we need to think more closely about the implications that uh, this entails and what they mean for the relationships be, uh, of citizens, uh, regulators, and firms. So this, uh, I think this has the potential and, and perhaps is already happening in, in changing uh, the dynamics between uh, in these triangles, in this triangle of regulators, regulatees, and uh, individuals. Um, as, uh, uh, 
uh, the background uh, for uh, this research that uh, Alon also mentioned in his presentation is that I've studied regulation by shaming in, in several recent uh, several recent projects. Uh, uh, regula in regulation by shaming, I mean um, uh, uh, that regulators publish adverse information and messages on corporations. Uh, which is designed to influence public opinion and induce public pressure on firms uh, to facilitate, facilitate some form of uh, private enforcement mechanism. Um, so this symposium has, has given me the opportunity uh, uh, to look at regulatory shaming uh, differently from what I'm used to in terms of uh, crowdsourcing. And, and broaden the focus um, of the research um, from uh, public-private enforcement to public-private monitoring as well. So I'm thankful uh, uh, for that. And, um, and so the article builds on several uh, uh, trends in the literature. It will combine law and regulation scholarship uh, regulatory shaming literature and crowdsourcing law and policy uh, literature. Um, and, uh, and so uh, with the time I have uh, left, I, I would like to address a few of uh, Alon's great comments. Um, so um, I, 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 will, I will begin uh, with uh, one of your last comments, actually. So you, you, you talk about uh, the future of crowdsourcing. And I think that uh, I, I agree with your uh, intuition that uh, crowdsourced regulation uh, will become more widespread in the future. I think that from what I see tracking regulatory regimes uh, in several different countries focusing on uh, shaming methods and uh, uh, crowdsourced monitoring, um, I think I can say that, um, uh, 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 sure, yeah, no problem, Ronit, uh, I have the time. I think I can say that um, uh, uh, this is a, a, a definite trend and um, with cautious uh, predict that this is something that will continue to grow. And so I hope that the paper um, will have uh, 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 relevance to uh, modern uh, regulatory um, regimes that, um, that use uh, these, uh, these, these type of tools. Um, you ask, Alon, uh, is crowdsourcing uh, regulation a better more mode of governance than uh, other modes of governance? Is it better than, um, how is it different from uh, historical modes of uh, uh, shaming or uh, from litigation processes, if I understand correctly? So regarding lit uh, litigation, I think that it's not, um, either or situation and um, generally crowdsourced regulation is um, uh, a tool that can be added to other more classic tools. And I believe uh, in general, and this is a good time to say it, that the regulator is not uh, taking a step back. It is uh, not um, stepping out of the picture. It certainly guides uh, the crowdsourced process and I think as uh, legal scholars, we need to, to think about how to um, uh, regulate uh, the regulation itself. So how, uh, which uh, obligations should uh, apply to regulators that um, use crowdsource uh, regulation. And we heard in the symposium uh, uh, in depth discussions of uh, crowdsourced individuals uh, in regards to their uh, rights um, and interests. And I think that regulators uh, need to take that into consideration. However, uh, looking more closely into the case study of the CFPB, I realized that uh, the American case study might 
a, a demonstrate a case of uh, over regulation of the process and alone you ask whether uh, uh, it might cost more than uh, uh, it uh, it brings to the table and I believe that um, the problem of maybe over legalizing the process uh, is is real and so um, uh, I, I will stop here. I see that I ran out of time and I hope that uh, I, I get a chance to respond um, uh, after uh, hearing uh, more uh, commentators. So thank you. So thank you very much, Aron, and thank you, Alon, again for your uh, great presentation. Um, any questions from other people would be welcome at this point. Uh, if anyone wants to make a comment or ask, uh, please raise your hand and I'm happy to hear. Yeah, Tama. So uh, thanks, Sharon. I thought this was a very promising project. I, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked uh, Galit yesterday, and that is the question of capture, right? Do we really have a reason to think that crowdsourcing uh, compliance and, and uh, crowdsourcing monitoring and enforcement would actually reduce uh, capture, which you say you think that might be the case uh, in your article. But I'm, I'm sort of concerned that this is not necessarily the case, especially if crowdsourced enforcement can be uh, anonymous or can be, you know, uh, uh, commentators can, could be uh, eventually paid and, uh, and manipulated in various ways that would lead to uh, positive uh, um, reportings or to uh, drowning out uh, shaming practices that the regulator might might want to uh, advance and 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 to and would be done in this what I what I was referring to as astroturfing would be done in transparency in transparently right that we would not know that this uh, uh, having more voices. Uh, uh, applauding the company rather than criticizing it is something that is manipulated or, or, or actually organized by the company uh, who's, who's paying for these services. Thanks, Tamar. Uh, great questions. Um, well, yes, uh, we can't uh, talk about regulation today, it seems, without addressing the issue of capture. And that is a big deal in the regulatory world. And uh, it should be addressed uh, when uh, discussing uh, uh, crowdsourcing regulation. Um, yes, in my paper, I, I, I write that um, uh, I'm starting to think at least about the idea of um, uh, if the regulator and the regulatee are, are, are less intertwined, they have less interactions because the regulation is moving uh, from the hands of government to the hands of civilians, then maybe, and, and perhaps this is a naive thought, uh, maybe we could see le uh, less companies trying to influence regulators. And um, we know from capture literature that Capture works best when uh, the numbers of regulators and regulatees uh, constantly interacting is low. So I was thinking that if we crowdsource regulation that, uh, to um, a large number of civilians, then perhaps when uh, we uh, share we share the uh, 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 the assignment, the task of regulation. Uh, to many, uh, what, is, what are uh, essentially unrelated uh, individuals, then perhaps we make it hard for firms to uh, approach, uh, uh, they can't approach each person and convince them not to shame uh, the company or you know, not to post some shameful uh, message online or um, uh, uh, give uh, or, 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 or publicize their complaint. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, I think you make a good point when you say that capture will always be there and firms will always find a way to, um, um, 
to 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 go beyond uh, uh, the, the the legal and regulatory structures and and bypass uh, bypass any restrictions and, and eventually through politicians or 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 more um, um, professional um, administrators uh, get what they want and manipulate the process. That is a, a discouraging uh, thought, but I think it has uh, a merit. So uh, yeah, I will have I will definitely have to think more on that point and develop it in in, in my paper. So thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, Alon wants to have another go. So yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm double dipping. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, following up on 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 Tamar, um, I think it could be interesting for uh, developing this part of the paper that deals with the problem of manipulation by using also the literature that exists about the abuses of platforms, uh, reporting mechanism. So there is literature about how those kind of mechanism that, that revolves exactly on the question of, of trust and about reporting about kinds of misdeeds um, that, that are misused and abused in a robust kind, in robust ways. And, um, and also there's an, uh, on the emergence, emergence of, of secondary uh, industries that help to streamline those kind of misuses. So there's a there's a great uh, Verge article about Amazon, and there are also uh, a lot of uh, both journalist reporting and academic writing about it. So it might be useful to think about uh, this part. Uh, so moving from the private to the public, uh, um, back and forth. Uh, and another thing that I didn't have the time to say earlier is: Do you have? Um, do you have examples of, of attempts to um, crowdsource both monitoring and enforcement together? So I have one example in mind, and that's um, the use, which is, is a bit different, but still is the use of Facebook um, to uh, monitor political um, monitor political uh, enforcement so the uh, monitor uh, political political speech so example of the uh, Israeli cyber uh, uh, division that um, asks enforcement by private by private entity of uh, speech on the platform but there are good good reasons to think that the monitoring also came from private individuals so it wasn't the monitoring itself was not done by uh, public figures, but it was also crowdsourced. So that's sure. an example that there's all the way through there are crowdsourced, crowdsourcing and outsourcing, which might be problematic in all kinds of ways. That when, and do you have any more concrete examples and that are more in line with the kind of, of your definitions of regulation and crowdsourcing? Right, thanks. So uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the references and, and we'll talk more on that. Um, um, sure, uh, the example that uh, comes into my mind is the uh, Irish EPA, uh, which regulates the uh, environmental issues in Ireland, Ireland, and they publish um, quarterly, actually, a list of um, uh, a, few a few companies, something like five companies, I think, that they put on the top of their list that have received the most complaints from uh, individuals uh, in the uh, measured uh, period of time. And this is a combination, I think, between crowdsourced monitoring and crowdsourced enforcement because they, all, they rely on um, complaints from citizens um, in order to shame companies. So they put it um, uh, on their homepage and they tweet about it, et cetera. Um, uh, another follow-up uh, from your question is, I think, if, if, if I got you correctly, I think it is important to uh, differentiate between um, intentional uh, uh, crowdsource monitoring and unintentional crowdsource monitoring, or I mean to say that 
is, uh, is are regulators uh, acting um, intentionally and creating, uh, facilitating the environment uh, in which um, a, a crowdsourced monitoring can exist, or is crowdsourced monitoring uh, just something that happens from uh, uh, bottom up, something that citizens um, do on their own, uh, while the regulator is uh, virtually out of the picture, it's very passive. It can perhaps enjoy the fruits of this kind of crowdsourced monitoring, but it, it, it is not really uh, uh, involved. It, it, it didn't initiate the process. And this is the type of situation that I want to live outside the scope of my uh, paper and focus on regulators that are uh, really uh, enmeshed in the uh, processes of uh, designing outsource monitoring and outsource um, enforcement. And just a quick comeback, if, I ha if we have uh, uh, just another second to uh, Tamar, I wanted to say uh, that I, uh, I noticed uh, that the CFPB has uh, in place the mechanism that um, uh, to screen uh, unwarranted complaints, uh, uh, unap inappropriate complaints, uh, perhaps duplicates or fake complaints. Uh, they have a lot of uh, text about it uh, on their website. And it made me think that perhaps that's what made me think that uh, uh, in addition to other things that I saw that they do, that we have to consider uh, perhaps over-regulating this process. Sorry for using regulation in two, two uh, different senses here. Um, and, 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 and I think that um, some of the appeal that uh, private enforcement and private monitoring uh, uh, might have could get lost in the way when we over legalize and over formalize these processes. Having said that, of course, um, we don't want the mob justice that Alon was uh, talking about. And, and so uh, this is the challenge for me to develop uh, uh, more in my article. Can I just, so uh, can I just say something? I agree completely, I think, the astroturfing problem comes in more at the enforcement, the shaming stage than at the, than at the monitoring stage. And I think you're right to notice that the, the regulator has more uh, control and more ability to sort of sift out these fake or phony complaints at the monitoring reporting stage. I think we have more to worry at, on, on this aspect at the shaming stage where the enforcement that is uh, that is achieved through social you know social media shaming can really very easily be drowned out by astroturf you know paid uh, uh, commentators that would be that would drown out the criticism so that's that's where I think uh, that issue comes up but I, I'm, I'm, I share a concern about overregulating this I think there is a fine balance to be found here right thanks. So uh, we have uh, two last minutes for this panel. If Sharon, if you want to say some closing remarks or um, um, anyone else. Sure, uh, if, there is a, a, if there isn't anyone else, yeah. I, I would. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, there is, um, there is another point that I've considered. Um, I don't know if I will include this in my paper, probably yes. Um, that I thought about um, how uh, crowdsourcing uh, through regulatory shaming um, is uh, more of an attempt uh, to threaten firms in crowdsourced reaction because um, sure, regulatory shaming has proven to be effective even when we don't have any indication that a crowd actually responded or was going to respond. Um, so I, I was beginning to think that perhaps this is a special type of crowdsourcing um, as we've seen in um, uh, Shelley's paper, uh, perhaps um, where she talked about um, um, uh, specific types of crowdsourcing um, 
that are uh, perhaps uh, a community-based or unintentional uh, versus intentional crowdsourcing. So uh, perhaps regulatory shaming is more of a threat of crowdsourcing or the potential of crowdsourcing where regulators intend to harness the reaction of the crowd and they uh, of course say so explicitly uh, in their naming and shaming policies and and firms react in accordance and deterrence is achieved and compliance increases um, but i'm not sure that we have many examples of um, you know uh, uh, regulatory shaming that was um that that actually uh solicited the crowd and and and, and an example that we can point to and say uh oh this is how it worked and therefore companies uh change their ways in reaction to uh the public discourse uh, or a boycott or uh, or something like that um so perhaps uh so this is that this is my point that that this sort of crowdsourcing may be um, based on the threat of crowdsourcing rather than the actual crowdsourcing, but I will have to think about it more. Uh, so thank you very much, Aron. The, the, this is really a great uh, note to, to finish on, uh, bringing back uh, these questions of, of uh, what is crowdsourcing and how, how do we look at it from different uh, perspectives. Um, so thank you everyone very much. Uh, again, thank you Shelly and Tamar, thank you Sharon and Alon, and I'll uh, hand over uh, the, the floor to Shelly and Tamar for closing remarks and discussion. Okay, uh, so thank you everyone very much for a really very invigorating three days. Um, I want to thank you for that and Shelly and I, I think it's fair to say we were really looking forward to this conference and it far exceeded our expectations. So, uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, let me uh, try in conclusion to sketch up, out some of the broader themes that have occupied our discussions across the different papers and over these past, uh, past three days. Um, and I've, uh, sort of, I've identified five such themes so uh, we spoke first about what is a crowd, right? How to understand uh, what it is, who it is composed of, how or whether uh, it could be distinguished from a political community or from individuals. Uh, some of us juxtaposed crowds from political communities and highlighted um, the fragmented, alienated aspect of being part of a crowd. Others stressed actually the personal and the collective empowerment of working to crowdsource science or to monitor environmental pollution or of contributing new ideas to municipal or national decision-making processes. A second theme was uh, how a crowd is formed, by whom it is formed. Is it the platforms who crowd and decrowd us? Can we work around their power to reorganize and in order to determine better labor rights or compensation for our contribution to improving AI-based products? Can we place regulatory demands that would obligate platforms to enable users or workers to organize through the platform itself and maybe against the platform to require uh, better protection of rights? We discussed the power that, uh, the role that power plays in crowd formation and recruiting, recruiting the people who will form that crowd and designing the goals of the crowd are the sort of tasks that stand before it and, and determining the procedures or the forms by which the uh, crowd will perform its task. A third, uh, a third theme is uh, what it means to, for the individual to be actually to be part uh, of a crowd. Does that affect or limit our ability to exercise our rights? Does it, rather than empower us collectively, actually extenuate the individualization and the fragmentation of politics? Can uh, crowdsourcing be this new mode of political participation? We noted that uh, we noted the need to insist that crowdsourcing takes into account those who usually remain outside of a crowd or a political community. We asked whether being part of a crowd conversely alienates us from our fellow citizens, deploys us to surveil or monitor them at the behest of a leader or a party or the regulator. 
A first theme was uh, the technical and the technological aspects of becoming part of a crowd, of the impact of a gamified technological environment on our sense of mission and our, and our relationship with others, the need uh, sometimes for there to be a regulatory or a statutory framework in place in order for crowds to be able to contribute their input regarding the facts on the ground or their preferences for policymaking. And we sometimes asked, does the tech make a difference, right, to our identification of a collective as a crowd? The tech that the crowd uses in order to collect data or the tech that platforms use, the government use or others to recruit uh, the crowd, the members of the crowd or to mobilize workers, for instance. And finally, we addressed the dilemmas and the, uh, the challenges uh, of extracting knowledge from a crowd. So we discussed aggregation and integration as competing approaches and suggested that they may need to be combined. And we discussed the difference in the interaction between political legitimacy and epistemic legitimacy. We talked about the importance of legitimacy of the process and discussed the difference between contributing ideas to policymaking and being part of the monitoring or enforcement mechanism of the regulator. We also noted the limitation of using non-experts to monitor compliance with, uh, with compliance with um, complex legislation. So these are just some of my thoughts overall. And I, I would uh, like to hear if any of you would like to add any concluding observations of thoughts. We had intentionally a lot of time for some concluding discussion. So if you are, please raise your hands. And before I actually hand it over back to the crowd, uh, let me uh, use the, uh, the stage to uh, thank our, all of our authors very much for your uh, diverse and thoughtful projects. We already look forward to the full papers. We could also not have had this truly fascinating conference without our brilliant commentators and panel chairs. So please join me in thanking them very much as well. Um, and I want to thank uh, Gila Stoffler, the editor-in-chief of the journal Law and Ethics of Human Rights, and the student editors who were here with us throughout the conference and who will be working on your papers. Uh, they will be in touch, right, Gila, with instructions regarding submission of the full papers uh, to the journal. And we'd also like to thank the people here at the College of Law and Business who designed our beautiful program and built the website and assisted in various ways. <laughs>